Um, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Paul Bruckman, and he's going to talk about uh, his experience with cannabis as both a patient and a doctor. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint. This comes straight from the heart. Um, my name is Paul Bregman, and I'm a medical doctor uh, with an inactive license now since uh, 2013 because I'm a medical cannabis patient. You can't have an active medical license as well as being an active medical patient. You can't, you can't pretty much, if you are board certified, board eligible, or overseen by a board pretty much in any profession, uh, from hairdresser to architect to lawyer to doctor to etc. If they know that you have a medical card, they probably will bring you in for drug testing and things like that. So just because you have a medical card, you're not protected when you're overseen by a board. So that's nurses, doctors, they find out about it. That's why I say privacy is very important regarding this. The stigma is still great. And to the most, to the max, I lost my license. I had to choose between suspension because of my uh, illness. So that's, with that being said, um, my story begins in uh, 1991. My illness is bipolar type two. My father had it. I'm 66 now. He had it undiagnosed, bipolar type two. His father had it. So in bipolar, there's bipolar type 1, which is mostly mania and some depression. And in bipolar type 2, it's irritability, depression, and hypomania. So hypomania is the difference than mania. Mania where you'll be up days and you'll go to Vegas and spend $50,000. With hypomania, it may be up, you know, you'll get some sleep, but you'll only spend $5,000 if you go to Vegas or $10,000. So that's where we talk about. So with me, it's bipolar type 2, characterized by depression severe depression, and irritability, and some hypomania as well, which caused some irrational uh, decisions regarding finances especially. But with that illness, which was made, really triggered in 29, and then when I was 29 years old and I started my residency. Up until that point I had a lot of structure and really I was able to control, nobody knew any different. I felt a little different, maybe moody or anything, but I. But when I started my residency and there was lack of structure, um, but I didn't see a psychiatrist and I thought everybody else was feeling along the same way and I never went into a real funk, never hospitalized or anything, but from 29 to finally getting a diagnosis at 41 by a psychiatrist. So I had struggled with it, mood disturbance, since 41, at 41. Finally diagnosed, bipolar, and started the medicine route, conventional medicine route. I didn't know anything about cannabis, so I was working as a radiologist, succeeding chief of breast imaging at Denver General at the time. So I've been moved here since in 87. So then we start the saga of med medicine, and as it turns out, I become treatment, I have treatment resistant bipolar illness. So 80% of the medicine people will respond to some sort of medicine, you know, 20%. The problem, once again, was in my liver. My P450 cytochrome is why I can't do edibles. My P450 cytochrome is missing some key elements genetically. It doesn't interrupt it. But it, enter it interrupted the psychiatric medicines because everything I could swallow metabolized in the liver, and I never could produce the active metabolites of the psychiatric medicines. And that was one of the reasons it didn't help my bipolar. So I moved along with trying one medicine, Prozac or lithium to, you know, you name it, I must have tried 20 different cocktails of medicine. I was under the, working with a psychiatrist, seeing him twice a week. So 91 to 94, in 94, I suffer a very severe depression. So I have my first course of electroshock therapy, okay? So you have three times a week, pass about a 60 watt electrical uh, bulb, you know, current through your brain, you're out, it's an outpatient procedure, and it's got a 90% success rate for both depression and mania, higher for mania. So I did that in 94 through 2002, every January, when the sun went, the days got short, 
I also suffered a severe depression with seasonal affective disorder. So I would have these treatments three times a week for two weeks, two times a week for two weeks, and then one time a week for three weeks as an outpatient and a quarter. And they do electroshock therapy all, of, all around in all the hospitals from 7 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon as outpatients as well as inpatients going on. So ECT, if push comes to shove, electroshock therapy is the thing to have. You may lose some of your memory, but it's going to save your life and it saved my life. So from 94, and then finally in 95, I had a retired disabled due to severe depression and the bipolar. So I walk, had to walk away from medicine at 45 years old in the prime of my career due to the, due to the illness. So between 95 and 2005, I struggled with the, the, the medicines, the, the, the psychiatrist, saw a specialist, was on, from Abilify, Seroquel, to lithium, to every medicine and cocktail. Finally, I read an article by Lester Greenspoon in 2005 talking about cannabis for treatment-resistant depression and depression in general. Eminent psychiatrist from Harvard. I had not used much in college, not much medicine in med school, hadn't used that many drugs, did a little this, did a little that, but you know, nothing much. 2005, smoked a little, and by that time I was married and had two young kids, and it changed my fucking life. I'm not sure if it's true, but the idea is in a treatment resistant, if I would have known about this in 95 when I would have left, or 91, you know, when I would have left, but certainly 95, I think I could have avoided all of the ECT treatments. Because the cannabis was the only medicine, in addition to a couple of, I, I take one mood stabilizer, it takes some Valium, and I still take the sleeping medicine after 20 years, which probably doesn't work. But the mood stabilizer is a divalproic acid, and it's a uh, anti-seizure medicine that has a secondary effect is mood stabilization. So that keeps the down, the upside down. So I started using cannabis in inhalation because they, uh, edibles didn't work in 2005. And um, I was more productive. I left. My mood was improved. I was more productive for four or five hours because the inhalation kind of wore uh, the side effect of that medicine, besides the side effect of all the psych medicine, but the side effect of cannabis for me was getting tired, getting a headache, and not being able to, the second time around wasn't as good as the first time around. But the inhaled cannabis, the edibles wouldn't work because of the P450, and so I stuck with flour pretty much and have used flour along the way. So we're in 2005, I started, it took me a year before I told my psychiatrist who I'd known since 91, because I was scared to tell her. The stigma was so great. And that's another thing that people have to address. How do you talk to your doctor about it? Here's a doctor who could, couldn't bring, the way to talk to your doctor is that you just don't come out and say, I'm using cannabis and this is the way it's gonna be. In my opinion, you say, how do you feel about medical cannabis? How do you feel about cannabis? And you as patients need to educate the doctor before you finally come out and say, this is where I'm going. Because you have to remember, when you start talking about cannabis in the doctor's office, you cannot ask him to chart it. It's got to be off the record. Because if the insurance company sees, this is stuff you're not going to hear from a lot of different people. People, I've been through it all. And you don't want to, I've seen Kaiser people come from Kaiser when I was doing evaluations, because I started doing evaluations in 2007, part-time, that they put down, if you should tell Kaiser people that you, you have a cannabis card, they put it under drug addiction. Right, so you have to be very careful, and you have to make sure that it's off the record if you're gonna to talk to your doctor about it, and if you reveal that you use it. So it took me a year, and he said to me, we've you known him to each other for a long time, he said, why didn't you tell me before? I said, he, I was scared. I didn't know what you think. He said to me, yeah, I wish you would have told me a year. I have nothing more to give to you. You know what I mean? And if something is working, we want to encourage that behavior. You know, that type of thing. So 2005 started. 2007, I started doing cannabis evaluations part-time. And I was good at that. And got that's how I became into a cannabis expert. So it's 2007. I was involved with 
testifying with Alan Shackelford, and I was involved with Matt Cook, and I was, so it goes back a long way. So my passion is just like Joe Cohn's and everything that I talk, talk to you. But in 2010, by accident, I told the cannabis, I called the Colorado Medical Board because my license had been active because I'd been checking in with them. But they said to me, you're working, you look good, How, why are you so productive? Fuck, I was on, excuse my language. I was, I feel like almost like I'm in an improv here. You know? The idea is, the idea is in my honesty and my, I had the card, and for the first time really felt good, and here I was being seen at the medical board on a regular basis, and I told them the bottom line is, the cannabis is really helpful in addition to the Valval Pro X. I can just combine Western medicine with alternative medicine, and this was helping me. And that's what I think needs to be done many times. It's not either or. Well, they said it's good for two weeks. And then two weeks later, I got a letter from the board saying, you can't use it, you know, and you're going to have to stop. And we don't, it's a Schedule One drug, and we don't approve it, even though your psychiatrist, your esteemed psychiatrist, wrote a letter saying, this is what you need, and so on and so forth. So it ensued a three-year battle, $40,000, fighting with the board, ultimately I lost, had to go an active or suspension, and they wouldn't even give me an administrative license so I could teach. I just wanted to really muzzle me once, because I was the precedent-setting case. I was the first MD who stepped up to the plate to tell them that this is what I was using. Because if they found out about it, so that word spread quickly. So unfortunately, it cost me because it cost me because this is what was the only treatment that really works uh, for me, for my bipolar two. It helps the THC. My regimen pretty much is using THC mixed with some CBD because the THC lifts my mood and goes to the CBD receptors in my brain like it's supposed to and does what it does and I moderate the dope like one puff or something like that, two puffs, microdosing, really. But, but the idea is that, so the THC helps me, the CBD works to calm me down. So the two together in flour or whatever is going to be, and microdosing is gonna be the best. So if you want a mellow high, you buy some R4, if you can get your hands on any CBD rich strain, mix it with some sasiva flour that you're using, and just mix the two, and it will be, you'll be high, you, it'll be a rounded high instead of a right angle sort of high, as I try to describe it. So that's that's was working for me. I needed the THC. So the medicines, as I said, I'm on the medicines that I've remained on for 20 years. I probably don't need the sleeping pill, but it's just part of the whole routine and the dynamic and things like that. The side effects are better. I still see my psychiatrist. And when we talk about bipolar, this is where it should be utilized, in the fact where it shouldn't be maybe the first go-to drug because we don't have the most research, and you have to be careful with anxiety and things like that. But it shouldn't, if you go through a certain protocol, in my opinion, psychiatrists or other docs, you hand out the Prozac, you hand out the Western medicine in the small doses, and if it's in the, patients are not responding to cocktails or they're suffering side effects, then before, if they start talking about ECT, the first line, the next drug up, is the cannabis. And that's in the depression. You know, it's to me it's malpractice not to use cannabis for every analgesic or anti-inflammatory or in specific cases in America today. Anybody from MD who's telling you they're treating headaches and they're not using CBD or THC for a difficult case, in my view, is committing malpractice because of what we know. And at least they should be referred out. So that's where I'm coming from with regards to that. THC with the prep, but you have to know what you're doing with regards to things because of the anxiety side and THC. Let's say anxiety disorder, we'll talk about that. Well, I bet you half, 50% of the people could be off their anti-anxiety medicine if they were taking the cheaper shoes and cutting it into 10 different slices of their CBD brand with like 30 to one and it's 60 milligrams of CBD, and they chopped it into six or eight pieces. They just put it under their tongue and they sucked it, and see how the anti-anxiety effect of CBD would be working for them. Not mixing too much THC in there at all, but just trying where we could see, and this is cannabis. First, I have schizophrenia. Papers have been written about CBD, strong CBD, and psychosis. Schizophrenia is very tricky because THC, as we all know, causes anxiety, can cause psychosis, can cause 
these things, and that's what you don't want. So people who are going in, that's why competent consultation with a physician like Dr. Cohn or myself, you know, I'm not practicing, I can direct you, like United Patients Wellness, Martha Gettys, you know, these are people who are specialists in the field and can write the protocol. So schizophrenia is tricky, but the CBD side, for psychosis is one thing. THC, contraindicated, you know, in my best guess. But you look at people like ADD, they're given Ritalin, they're given Adderall, it's basically speed, any, anyway. So you have patients that can't be, and I always get back to this, if patients cannot be controlled with Western medicine and the science and the side effects are not that great, there's no harm in moving forward to something low dose, microdosing the dust. Sulak talks about from healer.com or head break, these type of things that can maybe substitute and you'll see positive results. But the docs out there, 99% are not even thinking about it. They don't even know about it, that type of situation. So we've got ADD, ADHD, bipolar in some cases. Bipolar one, you have to be careful of because that's more uh, mania, so you don't want to produce mania with the THC, but probably high THC, high CBD. And then bipolar 2, like myself, which is depression, mostly depression. But the CBD helps with my anxiety and my feeling revved and the hypomania. And then we talked about schizophrenia. Now we get into other spheres, anxiety attack, OCD, uh, anxiety certainly, OCD I don't know much about, and whether, but I think if you laden with it with C CBD and you start slowly and you do microdosing that there's a place for this in, 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 in psychiatric medicine and in mental illness, especially for the difficult patients. So with that, that's, and so at this point in time, so I'm an inactive doctor, so everything I say, check with your own doctor about it, okay? <laughs> Don't believe, I'm just speaking as an information resource and a patient advocate as well. Any questions? Yes. You said that you're still taking um, some prescription drugs. Yeah, Divalproex for mood stabilization. What is it? Di it's, di it's called Divalproex. It's valproic acid. It's an anti-seizure medicine. It's a very common mood stabilizer. But the side effect of Valproic acid is the, or Valproic acid is the fact that a lot of patients gain 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds, and they become diabetic. So even though it's a good medicine, it's a good mood stabilizer, the side effects are healthy. But it's there. But there's other ones that, and there isn't a lot of psychiatric research going on because the money isn't coming back to them once again. So things have really sort of stopped. But the cocktails are still out, out there. Think of all the psychiatric medicines and then all the cocktails that go, go along with it. That's why this, this medicine, if you can get onto the right protocol, the protocol is the key thing. And as I said, there is purified stuff that's coming out, like groundswell dispensary on Colfax. They're making a really good uh, extract, like Evolab problems too, with a measured dose that goes, not transit, but, but goes under the tongue. And I haven't tried it yet, but I'm anxious to try it because I think this would be really good. That's where we're going with measured doses, knowing how many cannabis, what you're getting in THC and CBD, and that's the dose. Next question. Anything else? Okay. Yes. You said that you were higher CBD, low THC, right? Yeah, they only they're the only product that I know that For makes anxiety. this thirty to one ratio mm -hmm. tootsie roll. Well. And I actually had a lot of success with that same product because I hated it. Um, right when I felt one coming on, I said that it helped me a lot. Uh, but I was hearing earlier, and I've been taking a lot of higher CBD, low THC products. But is that maybe the wrong? No, I, I think you're asking dosing questions when you're asking Joe to help you. You need a consult. You need to go to you need to go to Dr. Cohn, and you really need to sit down with him and evaluate your whole system, and him to reevaluate what you're taking. Because I think you're taking a lot more. Yeah, but I think you're taking too much to begin with. You know, I think you just need a reevaluation to reestablish what you dose and to find out what that is, and also to see what the THC and CBD ratios are. Because I think you're doing a lot of guesswork that doesn't need to be done. And that goes for the whole room. That's why the specialist is there. If you're relying on the dispensary people, they may know some, but they're not doctors, or they're not nurse practitioners, so everything, it's worth the money to get the specialist rec, or a specialist 
concept. And as far as getting the message out, what we were talking about, about um, collecting data, the people have to find ways to collect the data. It's not going to be done just by talking about it. There's things out there like Anagami. There are data systems that will come in and help with the data collection and things like that. That I'll talk to Joe about or something like that. It's all talk, 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 and nobody really knows how to put the pieces in to collect the data and do all the right stuff. We have to, it's like changing the laws. I mean, people should go and chain themselves to the Senate or the floors in some of these states, like mental illness, the same thing, and make laws change. That's how it happens for gays. That's how it happens for LGBT. That's how it happens for, uh, for other people, for blacks, for Jews, anything. Yes? I'm an information resource. Consult to the industry, because I've been around for a while, dispensaries, edible companies, and things like that. And patients, yeah. No, no, that's fine. But that's right, information, re information resource. An expert, and also expert to doctors who get in trouble with the board. 